All righty. How are y'all doing today? Doing fine. Good. How are you? Doing well. Um, were there awesome. any questions regarding homework or anything like that today? No, sir. I have a question. Um, I was looking over the syllabus and mini labs. Is that something we'll be doing this, uh, this quarter? Um, I need to update them so that they can be done online. Um, so it is something that we will do. It probably won't be all eight of them. And um, I just need to update, like right now, they require physical access to components and stuff that you guys don't have. So I need to update them to be able to use an online lab platform, um, like uh, whatever Autodesk. Uh, Autodesk has a circuit simulation thing online for free. I think it's called like Circuit uh, CAD or something like that. Um, so I just need to make some updates so that you guys can do that. Um, they will be graded very similarly to the in-class assignments, meaning that they are uh, effectively a participation grade. If you try to do it, you'll get full credit. I just need to get off my lazy butt and uh, update the thing so that you guys can actually try them. Okay, thank you for the clarification. No problem. Any other questions or anything before we jump into the uh, in-class assignment on mesh analysis? I had a question on homework six, problem seven. Homework six, problem seven. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, that is the big, huge, ugly mesh circuit. Let me look at it. Yes, sir. Real. That's what it is. All right, give me just a second. Um, all right, so hopefully you all can see this big, ugly guy right here. Um, any specific questions? Really, this is, uh, in my mind, it's not particularly difficult. That being said, I am a jackass with a PhD in this stuff, uh, but it is extraordinarily tedious. I think there's turns out to be like nine nodes that you have to pay attention to. Yes, sir. That's what I was having trouble with, just setting up the nodes to where I could end up working out all the equations related to them. So it's going to have, you're going to have to solve this one using MathCAD. There's no way around it. Okay. Uh, yeah, because uh, using Kramer's rule, like there's not, there's not enough ways to do substitution or anything like that um, to get it down to something manageable using Kramer's rule and taking the determinants of nine by nine matrices by hand is uh, terrifying. So uh, MathCAD all the way. All right. um, if you don't still have your access to MathCAD, um, I think you guys got it in your freshman engineering curriculum, please send me an email and I will put you in contact with Ms. Ashley Osborne who can give you the uh, instructions and all the information to download it uh, for free. Sound groovy? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, if you need any help setting up the, the system of equations or anything like that, uh, I don't mind helping there, but I'd rather you get MathCAD and stuff installed first and just give it a whirl before we, uh, we jump back into that. This is probably one of the most, I don't know, I, I hesitate to call it difficult because you're just applying modal analysis, but it is one of the most annoying problems for sure that you're going to have this quarter, just due to the sheer volume of equations you're going to have to get. Because uh, I think it has nine nodes and then two controlling variables, so you're going to need 11 equations, I believe. So it's just ugly. Um, all right, any other questions before we jump into the in-class assignment? I'm good. All right, so let's do this. And uh, again, if if you still have a question about this problem, say uh, tomorrow's class, we'll jump in and work on a solution. But like I said, I'd prefer you try to get it uh, going with MathCAD first and then see if we actually need to spend the 35 minutes it's gonna take to work this guy. All right, um, let's see. Oh, there it is. Stop sharing. All right, so hopefully uh, you guys all watch the, the video on mesh analysis. Students typically seem to enjoy mesh more so than nodal. Uh, my best guess is because you don't have to worry about fractions, but it's 
effectively the exact same process. So in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. Um, but anyway, let's give this a whirl. So our first problem is very similar to the problem, uh, the first problem on the nodal analysis uh, in class assignment. In as much as you've already got your mesh currents defined for you. Um, so to be clear here, we're going to be looking at mesh one. Mesh two and mesh three. And since there are no current sources, we won't have to worry about apply, applying super mesh techniques or anything like that. Um, so we can write our KCL equation around mesh one. Um, so starting at the bottom left hand corner and following, following mesh current I1 around its clockwise loop, we have negative eight volts plus 14 ohms times I1 plus 12 ohms times I1 minus I2. Wouldn't that technically be KVL at mesh one? Uh, no, you, yeah, you're absolutely right. It is KVL, not KCL. Thank you. That is my fault. Kurtzall's yeah. nodal law. Yes, you're 100% correct there. KCL is nodal, KVL is mesh. Thank you. Um, any questions about our mesh one equation? All right, nobody's saying much of anything. So KVL at mesh two. I'm going to leave this one to you guys. So starting at the bottom left hand corner and working your way clockwise around the loop, what are we going to have? 12 I2 minus I1 plus 1.5 IX plus 22 I2 minus I3 equals zero. Plus 1.5 IX. You're faster than I can write it down. But I believe all of that is correct. Plus 22 I2 minus I3 is equal to zero. All righty. And then around mesh three. Somebody else, what are we going to have? You're going to have negative 10, 10 volts. All right. Starting at an odd place, but that's okay. I can oh, see my bet. That's fine. My... Whatever's right. comfortable with you. And then you have I3 minus I2 times 22 ohms. And then you have, and you have plus I3 times five ohms. Equals zero. Alrighty. Yep. And then we'll set, uh, excuse me, we'll solve this system of equations. So give me just a moment to do that. So if I can read my handwriting. <laughs> Are uh, you solving this with a, like a graphing calculator? I'm solving this with a TI-36. So no graphing calculators or anything like that um, are supposed to be allowed in this class. So you can either use a TI-36 or a Casio FX-115 or a Casio 991, I believe. Yeah, there's a system solve button on, on some of the early TI calculators. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if the 30 can solve systems of equations. I yeah, I have a 30. I don't think it would have that capability. Yeah. You might want to spend the $13 and get yourself a, uh, a 36, and it'll make your life quite a bit easier. And I also know for a fact that the, uh, the 30 can't do some of the complex number manipulation that the 36 can. And the last third of the class is going to be dealing with just oodles of complex numbers. So it would be very much to your benefit to get a slightly more advanced calculator. Okay, thank you. Yep. All righty. Uh, so let's see. That is 14 plus 12 is my coefficient for I1. 
negative 12 is my coefficient for I2, zero is my coefficient for I3, and when I move the eight over, I get positive eight for my constant term. Then for my mesh two equation, I have, oh, we forgot something. What is our equation for Ix? I1 minus I2. I1 plus I2. So it will be I1 minus I2, because as we follow the currents through that branch containing the 12 ohm resistor, Ix is directed down. When I1 goes about its clockwise path, when it's through that 12 ohm branch, it is in uh, the down direction, which is the same direction as Ix. And I2 is in the opposite direction. It's flowing up, so that's why it gets the minus sign. So I2 is flowing opposite of Ix, so it gets the minus sign. I1 is flowing in the same direction as Ix, so it gets the positive sign. Now, this is based entirely off of my mesh current drawings here. Uh, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Oh, goodness. Okay. Let's see. Thank you. So if you drew your mesh currents differently, then it could possibly be, you know, I1 plus I2 or I2 minus I1 or whatever. It just de depends on how you particularly draw them. But based on the way that I have all of my mesh currents drawn as flowing clockwise around their individual, I guess you'd call it almost like a window pane of the circuit, it'll be I1 minus I2. Okay, I see it. Thank you. All righty. So um, going back to equation two, because it has an IX in it then, I have minus 12 Ix, or excuse me, I1 from the first term and then plus 1.5 Ix from the second term. Then for I2, I'm going to have positive 12 minus 1.5 plus 22. And for I3, I have minus 22 equals zero. I have zero I1 in my third equation, minus 22 I2 in my third equation, positive 22 plus five I3, positive 10 goes there, solve. Uh, 848.847.56 two milliamps, 1.170 amps, 1.323 amps, which matches the answers that I have above. All right, so it looks like we did that one right, and that one's fairly straightforward. Uh, any questions regarding this first problem? No, sir. All righty. Let's move on to this guy. A little bit of an increase in difficulty. Um, all right. So our mesh currents are not defined for us. So we're going to need to go ahead and take care of that. So I'm going to have a mesh current I1, I2, and I3. And I'll go ahead and clearly label the meshes as well. I want a different color than that. So that's one mesh. That's two. And that's three. So what does it mean when I have a current source um, in the middle of the circuit like we have right now? What do I have to do? You have to make it a super is. mesh. Yeah. I'm going to have to apply a super mesh technique. So my super mesh, this is getting real colorful real fast, is going to be around this path. All right. So the first thing that I like to do is always make sure to do my current relationship equations first so that I don't forget about them. So 
So how can I express this three amp current source right here in terms of my mesh currents? Would it be I3 minus I2 is equal to three amps? Yes. Um, so I3 minus I2 is equal to three amps. And it's I3 minus I2 because our mesh current is flowing from left to right through that middle branch containing the three, ohm, uh, three amp source. So it's in the same direction. And our mesh current I2 is flowing from right to left as it flows through the three amp source, which is in the opposite direction. All right, so now let's go ahead and do our KVL at super mesh two three equation. So I'm gonna start at this point right here and go clockwise around my loop. So the first thing I see is a 40 ohm resistor and I have current I2 minus I1 flowing through it. Then I have a 30 ohm resistor with only current I2. Then I see a 40 ohm resistor with only current I3. And then lastly, I see a 30 ohm resistor current I3 minus I1 flowing through. That's two equations, so what do I have left to do here? Uh, you need to do K, KVL around I1. All right, so KVL at mesh number one. So starting from the bottom left-hand corner, what am I going to have? Negative 5 volts, 10 I1 plus 40 I1 minus I2. Plus 30 I1 minus I3. Plus 10 I1 equals zero. All righty. So three equations, three unknowns, no dependent sources or anything like that. So we should be good to go here. So let's take a moment to solve. All righty, so for my first equation, I have zero I1 minus one I2 plus one I3 is equal to three amps. Then on my second equation, I have minus 40 I1 and minus 30 I1. I have positive 40 I2, positive 30 I2, positive 40 I3, positive 30 I3. It's equal to zero. And for my mesh one equation, let's see, I have positive 10 I1 plus 40 plus 30 plus 10. For I2, I have minus 40. For I3, I have minus 30. And it's gonna equal to positive five. I get negative 2 over 11 amps, negative 35 over 22 amps, and 31 over 22 amps, or All right, uh, anybody else get similar numbers there since we can't really check these versus our answers yet? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All righty, well then, we're asked to find the power, let's see, supplied by each source in the circuit below. So for our five volt source, 
That's going to be the voltage drop over our 5 volt source. That's easy enough. It's 5 volts. Multiply by the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So what is that current? Negative 2 over 11. Yeah, so the exact same thing as I1. So minus 2 elevenths of an amp. Five, negative 10 over 11. Negative 0 0.90909 0 .9 repeating watts. So that guy looks good. Um, now the harder one. The power, um, let's see, supplied by our three amp source. How are we going to figure that out? Well, since it's a current source, can it only supply power? Or is that a misconception? No, so current sources could be supplying or it could be absorbing. It just depends on what, how, what, how the system is behaving. Okay, so we need to find the voltage shock over the three amp source, yeah? Yeah, so anytime we're trying to find the power absorbed or supplied by a source, we need to know both the current and the voltage. Since we're looking for the power supplied, I would argue that we want the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So I'm going to put a minus sign here, out the positive polarity terminal. And this is our voltage that we're trying to figure out. What I've labeled as V3A. So my question to you guys is then, how are we going to figure out that voltage? It would be 30 times I3 minus I1 plus 40 I3. So 30 I3 minus I1. So you're saying plus minus, let's call this guy V30. And did you say plus or minus 40? I3. Plus. So, um, I'm not 100% sure that you got your signs right, but you definitely have the right idea. I believe what you are suggesting we do um, in a slightly alternative fashion is to use um, KVL around this bottom triangle to figure out what that three, that voltage drop over the three amp source is. Um, yeah, no, I, I think you had your signs right there. Uh, so if we started with KVL at the at this guy right here, we would have positive V30 minus V3 amps plus V40 is equal to zero, which means V30 plus V40 is equal to V3 amps, where V30 is 30 ohms times I3 minus I1. I'm running out of space here. And then V40 is 40 ohms times, sorry, that should be I1, I3. So you're absolutely right. So that's our voltage, and then that's going to be multiplied by our three amps of current. That's 30 C minus three hundred and twelve point two seven three. Yeah. Um, so would it have mattered if we had done KVL around the top triangle to figure out that voltage? Mm. No, because the three amps is going into that triangle as well. Right. So yeah, it doesn't matter what path that we take um, in our Kirchhoff's voltage law loop. Um, the law of conservation of energy, as well as telogen theorem says effectively, whatever path we take, the power is going to have to be the exact same thing. Um, because we couldn't have two different powers 
Um, so if we had two different powers, that would mean that two different voltage drops were occurring over the same element, which cannot be true. So um, uh, the young woman who spoke up originally said that she used the bottom triangle. We could have used the top triangle. There aren't really any other paths that are particularly easy to do, but any path that contains that could work. So if you were a glutton for punishment, you could verify that the path that I've outlined in green works. I mean, it absolutely will. It's just wildly more difficult than it needs to be. So any, any path, as long as it starts and ends at the same point uh, and includes that V3 amp voltage, regardless of the polarity that you have when you do the path will be sufficient. So, alrighty. Problem number three. So how many meshes do I have here? Four. I do not agree with four. A mesh and a super mesh. So how many, me okay, let's, let's, let me rephrase my question then because we might be getting into an argument on semantics here. How many mesh currents am I going to have here? Three. Three. Yeah, three. All right. So let's label this guy I1, this guy I2, and this guy I3. Now, there is an interior current source, which means we should have to apply um, a super mesh technique here. So I'm going to try to draw a loop that will contain that interior current source. What's the problem with the loop I've just drawn? It includes another current source. Exactly right. So it includes a current source on the perimeter of the circuit, and there's no way for us to um, figure out what that voltage drop over that current source is um, because the, the voltage drop over that source is unrelated to the amount of current flowing through it. So what we have here is actually, it seems like it's going to make the problem harder, but it actually makes it rather trivial. Um, we have So is there anything wrong with the, the loop that I've just drawn around I1? No, no, sir. Okay, and there's no other loops that I could draw that would enclose that interior current source that wouldn't also effectively go through that perimeter current source. So what that means is that I'm only going to have to do one KVL equation and everything else is going to come from current relationships. So let's start. with those. So who can tell me what one of my two current relationships is going to be? I3 is equal to 7 amps. All right. I3 is equal to 7 amps. That's uh, because when I3 is flowing through this bottom branch, it's in the same direction as the 7 amp source. So I'm perfectly okay with that. Uh, who can tell me what my other one is going to be? Uh, 0.5 VX is equal to I3 minus I2. Yep, because I3 is going in the same direction. I2 is going the opposite. So I3 minus I2 is equal to 0 0.5 VX. All right. Um, my third equation is then going to come from applying KVL at mesh 1. Somebody want to do that for me? Uh, mesh one, is mesh one the one that you just circled earlier? Yeah, so mesh one is the one that has okay. mesh I1 circulating around it. Okay. It'll be five ohms times I1. 
and then it'll be 16 uh, plus 16 ohms um, times I1 minus I2. And then it'll be plus 21 times I1 minus I3. Alrighty, so this does equal to zero. All right, so that's perfectly correct. So now the last question, my other equation, I need to figure out how to express Vx in terms of my mesh currents. There are a couple of different ways that I can go about this. I wonder if any of you guys can see the very easy way. So Vx is defined as the potential difference between this node and this node, right? Because the positive polarity terminal is on that middle node and the negative polarity terminal is drawn in that top left corner, but that's all one large node, right? <clears throat> yes. So our options are We'll talk about the hard way first. I could figure out what this voltage drop over the 16 ohm resistor is, and then this voltage drop over the five ohm resistor is and add them together. And that would be a KVL loop or I could solve for the unknown voltage VX. Or I can recognize that this my negative terminal here is the same as having the negative terminal here. So Vx is just the voltage drop over the 21 ohm resistor. Did everybody see that? Yeah. Yes, sir. So Vx yes. defined as the voltage drop over the 20 ohm, 21 ohm resistor makes things rather easy to figure out, right? So it will be 21 ohms. What's the current flowing, what's the mesh current flowing into the positive polarity terminal? High one. What's the mesh current flowing into the negative polarity terminal? I3, negative I3. There we go. So that's our equation for Vx. Okay. So I have drawn it in this way to make it as confusing as possible. Um, and I will, I will absolutely do mean stuff like that on your exams um, just to kind of, I don't know, uh, the idea is to reinforce the, the basic definition of a voltage, just the potential difference between two points in a circuit. And then you could use any KVL path you wanted to, to come up with that relationship, including a simple KVL loop effectively just around that guy to see that the voltage drop over the 21 ohm resistor is exactly Vx. All right, so we can substitute this guy into this guy and solve our system of equations. So let's see, our first equation. Um, hmm, well now this begs the question, do I wanna just leave Vx as a variable since I know that I3 is seven amps? Eh, I'll solve for I1, I2, and I3, all right. So my first equation, zero, zero, one, seven. My second equation, let's see. So I'm gonna have 21 I1 plus one I2 minus 21 I3. When I move that over, it's gonna be minus one more I3 is equal to zero. So to be clear, I'm saying 21 I1 minus I3, zero is 21 I1 plus I2 minus 21 minus one I3. Yeah, just making sure my algebra is working for me so I don't make a mistake like in the last time. Um, let's see, five I1, 16 I1, 21 I1, minus 16 minus 21 equals 
Zero, solve. Six point nine zero seven eight point nine four four and seven. Yeah. That's what I got for mesh currents I one, two, and three. Did anybody else get something similar? Yes, sir. All right, so we were asked to solve for Vx, so we can do that really easily using this equation. 21 I1 minus I3. Button. I1. Three, not I two. So I just got negative one point nine four four four, which is absolutely not the value I got previously. So, what mistake did I make in setting up my system? Let's. I think you may have forgotten to multiply the VX part by a half. I absolutely did. That is 100% that is what it was. Thank you. So this should be 21 over 2, and that should be 21 over 2. All right, so this guy is going to be minus 21 over 2. Minus one. Well, that should do it. All right. So, 21, yep, there we go, negative 3.5 volts, all right, so that's looking good so far. Okay, uh, the power supplied by my 7 amp source. So this is going to be similar to what we had to do um, in the last problem, we want the power supplied by the 7 amp source, which means we want the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do minus plus V7 amps. And I'm just going to redraw that mesh current so we're clear what's happening there. So how could I go about getting that voltage? Um, you can do uh, 5I1 plus 20I2 is equal to that voltage. Yes, you are a wonderful eye for finding the easiest possible way to do it, because that is absolutely correct. If we do a KVL loop around the outside, effectively, we, we're going to eliminate a lot of the, the calculation effort that we need. Um, so V7 amps is going to be the voltage drop over the 5 ohm resistor. So that's 5 ohms times our current I1 plus the voltage drop over our 20 ohm resistor, which is simply 20 ohms times I2. So 5 I1 plus 20 I2, 209. One six seven volts. So the power absorbed by our seven amp source is simply that multiplied by seven. 
1,464 watts or 1.464 kW. Alrighty, what are we going to do to find the power supplied by the dependent source? Well, we need the voltage. Oops, sorry, that's just the wrong direction. We want the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So um, I've labeled a voltage B dependent that I can use. Um, so now I guess what path is easiest? Right, I'm gonna have to do Kirchhoff's voltage law around some path in order to figure out what that is. Is it just gonna be that bottom path with 21 ohm V, uh, 0 0.5 VX, 25 ohm and the V7 amp? We could go that route. Yeah, that's that seems easy enough. Um, so let's see. So I'm gonna say, let's call this V25. This one's a little bit less straightforward. So I'm gonna actually label everything here. So I have V21 minus V dependent plus V23 minus V seven amps is equal to zero, which means V dependent is V 21 plus, I'm oh, sorry, that should be 25, not 23. I just can't read my writing. V 25 minus V seven, where V 21, the voltage drop over the 21 ohm resistor, positive polarity terminal on the left is going to be what? Twenty-one ohms times the I three minus I one. I three minus I one. Absolutely right, because I three is going into the positive polarity terminal. I one is going out the negative polarity terminal. Um, going to add to that the voltage drop V twenty five positive polarity terminal on the left, negative polarity terminal on the right. So that's going to be twenty five. So what's my uh, what's my total current flowing through the twenty five ohm resistor? Twenty-five times I3 minus I2. Yep, I3 minus I2. And then lastly, I subtract V7 amps, which we know to be 209 and one-sixth of a volt, so 0.167 volts. Add all this jibber-jabber together. Wait, why is it I3 minus I2? Uh, so I3 wait. is flowing into the positive polarity terminal of the 25 ohm resistor, and I2 is flowing into the negative polarity terminal. Oh, did y'all use the bottom mesh? Yes. Oh, my bad. I used the I2 mesh. My, sorry. Yeah, so th that's, the, that's the thing about this. Like, there are, I think, four different meshes that we could use on this one. Um, none of which are really any more difficult than the other. So uh, we're currently using this bottom mesh right here. You could just as easily use this mesh, or you could go around this one too, not terribly more difficult. You know, it do doesn't matter which path you take as long as it contains this voltage drop over that current source, then we're good. Um, all right, okay. so minus this one. So I got a voltage of negative 249.417 volts. So the power absorbed by the dependent source is then one half Vx times negative 249.417. So that is see, negative seven fourths. positive 436.4 four 
seven, nine blocks. Alrighty, so this last one was uh, a little tricky. Did you go back down to the bottom? Because I missed something at the bottom. Sure. Wait, so what are the three equations that we were using for this one? So I use this guy's equation one this guy as equation two, and this guy as equation three. I substituted in this relationship for Vx into equation two. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, alternatively, you could have just said I3 is equal to seven amps, and you could have just had variables of I1, I2, and Vx, and use your system solver to solve for Vx directly, but I, for whatever reason, did not choose to do that. Any other questions regarding this problem? Uh, not this problem. Can, can you go back to problem two? Because I sure. tried doing doing it like by hand, and I got something different. I just didn't see what you got for the currents. Okay, so my answer is for the currents there. So by hand using substitution, or by hand using Kramer's rule. Um, I was trying to do, um, I think, substitution and then trying to just plug into the calculator because I don't have MathCAD, so it wasn't something I could do easily. Well, this is a three equation three unknown, so um, again, you should have a calculator that can do this right now. Oh, well, I guess I'll know how to do it on here then. Okay. I was just trying, I was just doing like the matrix thing. Yeah, um, so what I might do, uh, I might try to go in, actually, I think there's, um, sometime this week, I will endeavor to create a video that will show you guys how to use a TI-36 and a Casio um, 115 to solve a system of equations. I know that there's a computer-based Casio emulator that I can do it for, for the Casio pretty easily. Um, but I'll have to see if I'm going to have to physically record myself punching numbers into a TI. Um, but I'll try to get that up this week um, before your first test so that you can see how to utilize these calculators to solve these systems. Uh, because you're going to be asked to do nodal analysis and mesh analysis on your exams and um, learning how to use your calculator will make things much, much more quick than uh, trying to do it through substitution and stuff like that. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know if you have the Casio FX991, that actually has four uh, system solvers, so not just three. Yep, that is the only calculator that is FE approved that is capable of solving a four by four system of equations. Um, I, if I, uh, like on your exams or anything like that, if I ask if, if there's a problem, it will have. Uh, for sure, a way to reduce it down to three equations, three unknowns, um, so that you don't have to buy that one specific calculator. Um, but, you know, it can't hurt to be able to solve one more equation or whatever that might um, change your options a little bit. But it's not going to be required of you to have that one specific calculator to solve a problem on my test. So the TI-36 can solve more than three equations? No, the TI-36X can solve three equations, three unknowns. The maximum? Cas maximum. Yes. The Casio FX-115 can solve a maximum of three equations with three unknowns. And the Casio 991 can solve a maximum of four equations with four unknowns. Okay. All right, any other questions regarding uh, any of this stuff? I'm good. All righty. Well, I will catch you guys tomorrow morning then. Thank you, Dr. See you. Yep, see you later. Have see a good you. day. You too.